Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation today. Um, today I'm going to talk about how to scale out our time series database infinitely uh, using Kubernetes, Envoy, and other open source products. Anyway, let me introduce myself. My name is Hiroki and belonging to LOI Corporation. And my main mission is to build and operate time series database that is kind of developer platform to accommodate a petabyte scale of metrics. And also, there is Prometheus compatible API. Anyway, let's cut the chase. Raise your hand if you have experience uh, dealing with petabyte scale of metrics by yourself. OK, there is no one. That's fine. Um, observability is really having evaluating for many people. This means uh, many people think about to save the more data for telemetry, tracing, logs, whatever. So this means as data increases, um, several issues showing up to accommodate petabyte scale of data in the future. This means cost, scalability, capacity issues may show in NAP in the future. All right, so LD, one of platform engineers in the company, I'm going to talk about how to deal with petabyte scale metrics by using several open source products and object storage um, and Kubernetes. All right? First things first, let me introduce our background of our products for better understanding. So as I mentioned, um, our time series database is compatible with Prometheus API. So these clients should be like Prometheus instance, metrics collector, uh, open telemetry collector, and metrics agent. So these are our clients, right? And of course, we provide ingestion API, and this API tries to save the data into our time series database. And additionally, we provide query API, and that is from QA compatible API. This means you can see your data uh, via your Prometheus or Grafana to show up your data as the graph and dashboard, right? So this platform is called IMO Flash in the company. All right, in the first place, what is the metrics? Metrics consist of two types of data, metadata or sample. For metadata, this is just a kind of key value pairs. It's like pod name and no name and environmental name, whatever. And for sample, this is like actual time series data. This is a tuple of timestamp value and metric value. So this is metrics. All right, let's, act the, let's look at the, our query path in the system. Um, our client tried to send PromQL request to our query API. And then this API tries to retrieve target metrics ideas with given PromQL and time range in the request by requesting for metadata specific database, right? After that, this database returns the metrics ideas. Then this API tries to retrieve the samples with given target metrics ideas and time range in the request by requesting for sample specific database. And this database returns the samples to API. And then this, this API evaluates the given samples uh, with PromQL engine and returns the final results to clients. So this is how it works of our system. All right, as I mentioned, there are two types of database, metadata-specific database, sample-specific database. And also, each database has two layers, in-memory layers or persistent layer. For in-memory layer, this is for the data within 24 hours, right? This is like hot data cache. 
uh, database. And also for persistent layer, this is for the data after 24 hours. And we are using open source products out there. It's like Elasticsearch for metadata and Cassandra for sample database. So this is our time series database, right? And also, this is the uh, data size. So obviously, um, sample data usage is dominant in the data usage. So we already have one billion of metrics and one petabyte of sample data with replication. And also 2.7 terabytes of sample data is being ingested every day. So this is obviously uh, sample data is dominant in our data usage. This means Cassandra is the bottleneck for our use cases. But of course, we already know Cassandra is a really great product in most of use, most of use, use cases. But unfortunately for time series data, this is the bottleneck for us. With these three issues, cost, scalability, and capacity. And basically, we are enforced to use our private cloud services instead of AWS or GCP, whatever. So there is no managed service for Cassandra. This means you need to provision your uh, physical machines or virtual machines to deploy Cassandra by yourself. And also, we already have 420 nodes in the cluster. So this means uh, server cost is really expensive in a year due to the petabyte scale of data. And for scalability issues, it takes six hours to scale out even single node, right? Due to the petabyte scale of data. And basically, Cassandra provides repair commands to detect data corruption and repair automatically the data corruption. But unfortunately, our repair commands for our cluster never completes due to the data size. And even worse, we are not allowed to obtain additional servers to provision any additional Cassandra cluster. So this means um, we don't have enough capacity to accommodate users' metrics. So to mitigate this issue, these three issues, we needed a new data storage layer for accommodating huge amount of samples. Right? Then, why not use object storage? Because this is a really effective way to accommodate huge amount of data, right? And also, by delegating storage concerns, it's like replication or backup or clustering things to object storage. We don't have to implement them by ourselves. So this is a really huge advantage, right? And also, there is a S3 compatible S3 service in our private cloud services. This means it has a sufficient capacity and scalability. And also, there are a lot of real world battle tested examples like Cortex and Mimir and Thanos. They are open source products dealing with time series data and metrics as well. And also, this backend storage is obviously object storage as well. So that's why we believe that we attain the, this kind of architecture on top of the object storage to accommodate petabyte scale of data. But some people may think about uh, migration on Cassandra into your Kubernetes cluster. But unfortunately, even though you migrate your Cassandra cluster into your Kubernetes cluster, uh, data usage itself never change, right? So in that sense, um, the data cost and scalability issue never go away. So that's why when we, we, we went with object storage way. All right. So the final goal architecture is going to be like this. We are going to have this additional persistent layer on top of the object storage. This is for the data um, after two weeks. Why not replace Cassandra entirely with object storage layer? 
Um, there are several reasons, but um, the most significant is because uh, we couldn't anticipate the performance impact on user workloads because object storage is well known as higher latency storage server, right? So we need to gather some experimental um, feedback from user workload and production environment. And of course, we are aiming for uh, migrating to entirely to object storage layer in the future. Anyway, so how do you construct such kind of database on top of the object storage? I think there are three important things, data structure and distributed writing and distributed reading. So I'll explain one by one. All right, first three data structure. So let me clarify the requirements. The input is supposed to be target matrix IDs and time range. This is given in a request. The output can be like the tables of timestamp value and metric values. So this is a requirement. And also data sharing is really important because there is a limitation in our private cloud S3 compatible object storage. That is the object count limitation in the bracket. That is 10, uh, 10 million uh, object counts in the packet. So in that sense, uh, you are going to have one billion of files if you don't merge multiple samples into a single file. So it's inevitable to merge multiple samples into a single file. Otherwise, it's not feasible. And also sharding is a really effective for concurrency control and concurrent processing data, right? So that's why sharding is a really important thing. So we define two types of strategy for that. The first one is bucket-based sharding. So each bucket has one week of time window data. And also it includes all data of shares. And for directory work, this actually represents a shard. And a shard is composed of four hours of time window and tenant ID and shard factor, these three combination. So this is the sharding strategy. So the final data structure is gonna be like this. Um, one bucket has one week of data and each directory represents each shard. And each shirt has a single sample files combined with multiple samples data. But you don't want to download this entire file whenever you query for your object storage, right? Because this sample data file is really too large. So that's why we introduce index file. This is kind of a mapping table between target matrix IDs and byte offset in the sample files. So with this, you can identify the byte location in the sample files before you query and you download the data, and you can partially download the sample file by using by range request, that is S3 compatible API. So this is the data structure, right? So how do you write this kind of data structure on object storage? So let me clarify the batch processing of Cassandra because the new one should be similar to this one. Um, batch server retrieves one, one, uh, four hours of data first uh, from the sample database. This is in memory database layer. And this batch server tries to save and compress the data into Cassandra. So this is how it works on Cassandra batch processing. But how do you apply this concept to object storage? Basically, batch server randomly retrieve the data from a random node of a memory database or sample database. So this means, according to some sharding strategy, you need to aggregate your data somewhere. So this is the space where the new component shard aggregator comes in. 
So basically, Shan's aggregator aggregates all samples of each shirt, right? According to sharding strategy we define. And also, to ensure the scalability, um, when we increase the number of shirts, it also can be increased the number of parts accordingly. And also, data resiliency is really important. So once it receives the data from batch server, it needs to persist the data in local disk. It's like write a headlock so that it can recover any data in case of pop down or any failure when rebooting. So this is the shard aggregator. Anyway, unfortunately, we were in the legacy world we, where we provisioned the physical machines or virtual machines to deploy our old components. So we didn't, do, we didn't use Kubernetes at all. But we are really motivated to migrate all components to Kubernetes. There are several reasons, um, you know, infrastructure abstractions and self-healing and unified observability and unified deployment flow. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to use Kubernetes. So as the starting point, we went with Kubernetes for the new components. So the writing architecture is going to be like this. Now we have Kubernetes cluster and NGX as the L7 load balancer and also shared aggregator. So let's look at how it works. At first, batch server need to calculate each shirt. So which shirt is going to uh, be responsible for with given request, right? So in the, after that, batch server put the shared factor in GRBC header and send the data into NGX, and NGX routes the data to corresponding part um, using the GRBC header calculated by batch server. And after that, shard aggregator persists the data in local DB, uh, which is LSM3 based database, and level DB we use. And after once each shared aggregator aggregates all shares of data that is responsible for, it tries to save the data into object storage. So this is how it works. But choosing right key value store, right database, is a really important thing, right? And shared aggregator is obviously right intensive workload because reading only, um, reading is happening only once. This is when uploading the data into OJX storage, right? So that's why we chose LSM3 based database, um, uh, specifically level DB. Of course, you can use RxDB, but the reason is because this is a really optimized on right performance. So that's why we chose LSM3 based database. And also, we did some additional optimization on LSM3. So as I mentioned, reading only happens once. This is when uploading the data into object storage. So we disabled compaction and page cache because these two things are aiming for um, make the reading better, right? But this is not necessary for our use cases because reading only happens once. So by, used, by disabling these two factors, we can get less memory consumption and better write performance. So as, and also, additionally, we did um, merging of multiple F-Sync calls into a single one. Given the nature of Kubernetes and container world, a node has several parts, and all parts in a node shares the same kernel, pay, kernel space. This means even though a part is down, that page cache still remains. So in case of part failure, a part uh, still can recover of the state from this data cache and sync later. So by doing this, we can get better performance. 
right? So as a result, uh, with 32 shunt aggregator pods, um, it takes 40 minutes to aggregate and complete a uh, batch writing 450 gigabytes every four hours. And also, each pod consumes only 3 gigabytes as the memory usage. And also, no outage can be seen so far since we last um, deployed this component last year. So this is a result of right, uh, right performance. All right, let's move to reading. So now we have query API and object storage. So how do you retrieve the samples from object storage? This is the space where the new component storage gateway comes in. What storage gateway? Storage gateway basically communicates directly with object storage to retrieve the samples from object storage, right? And also it behaves as cache as well. This is for reducing RPS for object storage and also return, returning the results as possible, uh, faster as possible. Okay, anyway, let's look at the flow, actually. So Query API tries to request for samples by calling storage gateway grpc calls. And storage gateway tries to download index. This is a mapping table between target matrix IDs and actual by location in the sample files. And then this identified by offsets in the sample files then it tries to partially download the actual samples with byte range request from object storage. Then it returns the samples to query API. So this is how it works. But what about cache? Again, choosing correct, correct key value store is a really important thing. So storage gateway is uh, obviously reading intensive workload, right? So in most of the time, reading is happening in query time. So that's why we chose bplus 3 based database. Um, that is LCD.io, Bvolt. Um, that is used in LCD in Kubernetes as well. So we chose this one for storage gateway as well. So on top of the Bvolt and Envoy, we built distributing cache. So as I mentioned, Bvolt is really performing well on reading intensive workloads. And also with the nature of time series data, exact same queries is coming in. So in this case, page cache is really working well. This is like memory cache. And also, uh, we chose Envoy instead of Nginx because this natively supports active health check and also maglev consistent hash. Basically, we want L7 LV to route same request to same pods as possible, right? And to achieve that, we need consistent hashing algorithm and also Maglev is really optimized on even distribution. So that's why we choose Envoy. Okay, so let's look at the architecture. Query API firstly split the request into some multiple parts according to shared. So a request means a shared request, right? So Query API calls grpc call via Envoy and this envoy routes a shared request to a fixed pod by Maglev consistent hash. And storage gateway tries to download index and samples as I mentioned, and then it saves the data in local cache, which is Bvolt. Then it returns the results via envoy, and query API merge all results so that it can return the result you users, actually. So this is how it works. But this is still slow. Why? 
So this is when we should pinpoint the bottleneck in query path by using observability tools like PyroScope or Grafana Temple. Uh, we already use PyroScope for continuous profiling and Grafana Temple for distributed tracing. And with this, we realize that downloading an index or decoding index is a really consuming task in terms of CPU usage. Because index is a really huge for really huge to be decoded or downloaded every time whenever it requests come in. So that's why we reduce the area of downloading area and decoding area. So we introduce index of index. I'm not sure what I'm saying, but index of index is like mapping table between matrix IDs and by offset. This is similar to index and sample file, right? So instead of download or decode entire index file, you can use this mapping table and identify the byte offset of partial data of index so that you can partially download the data and partially decode the data. So the delt region of index file is really significantly reduced. So you can save tons of CPU time. So this improves the really uh, working well to reduce the query latency. So as a result, read performance is really well, comparable to Cassandra. So even though you retrieve one month of data, uh, only nine seconds takes a P9090 latency. So this is a really uh, performing well. Lastly, let me explain the additional feature on top of the object storage database. So we introduced and published bring your own buckets feature that allows users to use their own object storage and buckets. This means we don't have to pay for additional costs to expand our storage capacity. Instead, just users can bring their own storage. So this new feature actually remove our storage capacity limitation. So we can infinitely scale out our storage capacity. So this is bring your own buckets, right? And lastly, petabyte scale of metrics is not an issue anymore. On top of the distributed writing, distributed reading, and some observability to improve performance, and LabelDB and Nginx is a really uh, good product for our distributed writing so that we can get scalability on writing. And also, Bboat is invoice are really performing well on distributed reading. And also, scalability is uh, we can get uh, scalability for reading as well. So thank you for everyone and also any, everything in the community. I think lastly, I can say we are always seeking opportunities to contribute our knowledge to community. Because with this project success, for this project of success, um, this is a really relies on heavily my experiment of contributions to Loki, Grafana Loki. So by leveraging my experiment, uh, we attained this kind of architecture. So that's why uh, we really want to um, convey and uh, tell our knowledge to community so that I hope the time series database and other open source products for observability get more mature. So we always seek in these opportunities. Let's talk about and discuss. Anyway, thank you for everyone and thank you for listening to my session.